we're live. We're back. The Coverage Your Podcast. Um, it's a East Coast. It's a late Thursday um, evening or afternoon. Uh, everything's sort of blending together um, in this summer. And I still have my COVID hair, but I'm, I, I already scheduled to lose it. So that's coming. I should be nice and clean for the next podcast. And um, of course, we're going to be talking about insurance innovation. I have uh, Sophia Pogreb of Next Insurance on. Sophia, welcome. Thank you. Honored to be here. I've got COVID hair going on as well, so we're good. Uh, something about the COVID hair. We're going to, um, you see, you occasionally see photos of like uh, high school yearbooks with hair or going back to the 70s. This is going to be encapsulated in time. Remember 2020. Look at the hair. Oh, my God. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. You know, if that's the worst thing we walk away with from this, I think we've done yes, well. Yes, very true, very true. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Next Insurance. So I kick all of these off, Sophia, with an opportunity for an elevator pitch. Um, who are you? What do you do? And what can you tell us about Next Insurance? Yes. So I'm Sophia Pogreb. Hi, everyone. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Next Insurance. Um, we are all about small commercial insurance, insurance for entrepreneurs and their businesses. Um, our goal in life is to be the one-stop shop for small business owners looking for property and casualty coverage. We want to be there when they come to us, whether that's on a you know 11 p.m. on a Sunday or at 2 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon, and we want to provide them with all of the coverage that they need in 10 minutes or less at an affordable rate and with phenomenal service. We are very passionate about entrepreneurship and small businesses. We feel it's been an underserved segment in the insurance industry and beyond. Yep. And we really want these folks to uh, be successful and we want to have a hand, a helping hand in that. Yep. We've been around for a little bit over four years. I've been with the company for three and a half. And I lead several of our functions, namely um, our insurance team that figures out what products we should be selling to customers and how to price them, our operations function, data, and also our agency business. Fantastic. Um, so you brought up the small business and the entrepreneurial aspect of small business, uh, completely underserved, right? And I think the, um, the, some of the legacy um, industry, but also um, some other startups have also recognized that as mm -hmm. well. So um, in a way, if you can discuss um, that part of what, what separates next, like your view of that market and how you wish to sort of attack it that might be a little bit different than how a legacy carrier or another startup might think of helping or assisting entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Great question. I would love to hear your thoughts on this, um, but we believe we're quite different from everybody out there serving small businesses in a couple of ways. One on the um, you know, product scope front. If you look at InsurTech for small business, uh, few if any players are multi-product players. Um, there are quite a few startups out there focusing on a specific product, whether that's GL or workers comp or DNO. Um, we offer four lines of business today, general liability, professional liability, commercial auto and workers comp. Okay. And they're in the process of adding more. So again, that one-stop shop vision, which is really the crux of what we want to become, um, we think is quite unique to us. For good reason, right? It's a lot of work to offer uh, top quality products across such a broad range of lines of business. So I think that's one piece that makes us unique. The other piece is our full stack model. The fact that we do um, sort of the entirety of the process, starting with distribution and customer acquisition, through owning the product and the pricing and the coverage, to um, you know, the policy management, the binding, the servicing yep. is completely in-house. To claims, 
which you know, the majority of is in-house for us as well, um, that is quite unique and unusual, particularly in the startup world. Yeah. Um, so we don't really see any direct competition in InsurTech, but I, I would love to hear your perspective on this as well. Well, I think from the, I think it's a very underserved market because um, traditionally in the past, you know, um, let's just, let's talk about traditionals before any um, startups. Um, traditional business models make it difficult to serve small businesses because often the premiums wouldn't justify it. Correct. You know, and so it was a lot of work to find the business. It was a lot of work to place the business. Then it became a lot of work to service the business. And so um, you see, it's, it's, it's coincidental. I was just watching a uh, producing video, like how to be a better producer. And one of the, one of the criteria for the agency is um, increase your minimum premium, mm-hmm. right? Like just stop mm-hmm. working on stuff that you just can't make any money on. So it's teed up nicely, right? For a more tech oriented approach mm-hmm. where it's, uh, digital, um, you can have a lot of uh, tech-oriented uh, software and tools like chatbots and other things that can do a lot of heavy lifting for because mm-hmm. the servicing part becomes a lot of the common questions. I need a certificate of insurance. I need to change an address, stuff like that. That in the past it was a human being that was doing this, so it was literally hours of um, human time. Work. Yeah. costly time to do that. So it seems like the there's a um, nice convergence of um, need where we have a lot more entrepreneurship going on, a lot more small businesses starting, uh, dovetailing nicely with a digital environment where it's like, finally, you know, we can, we can find you and we can service you better. I think what is particularly unique about yours is the multi-line approach. Mm-hmm. Um, it would, it seems kind of counterintuitive to do all of those things and then force the small business to go get their auto somewhere else. You know, um, the, the, um, I'm a big fan of bundling. Might as well I save time. That's right? a win-win, right? It's no? a win yeah, for everybody it's, it's, in the value chain and more, most importantly for the customer. Yeah. And when we speak to our customers, they really value the ability to get multiple needs met with the same provider right ability to go to one portal to get their certificates yeah they don't want to be making multiple phone calls or multiple visits they have too much to do right they've got this to run um so um the challenge has always been in in the insurance space is that um you know it gets uh, each each of those aspects have been traditionally very expensive Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, customer acquisition is generally very expensive. It's just it's hard to find that mm-hmm. business. Once it's in the door, you're hope if it's, pr- you know, if it's profitable, it kind of alleviates some of the issues. But again, the certificates of insurance, especially small businesses, you have a lot of um, certificate work that you have to do. If it's, um, you know, small businesses that deal with property, you may have to change the lender. So there's mm-hmm. there's paperwork that has generally needed to be done. Like, it's, like we talked about human intervention usually, so that's expensive. So um, sort of, you know, kind of kicking it back to you, let's go to that front end customer acquisition um, has always traditionally been extremely difficult insurance mm-hmm. uh, for, you know, to find customers. So it's been rather expensive to acquire customers. How does next, think given your digital footprint your digital dna so to speak how do you think about customer acquisition so you, so that the costs don't get out of control and you end up any efficiencies you create in the back end you lose in the front acquiring the customer how do you think about that yeah big area of focus for us we have we are proud to have an industry leading uh, marketing team particularly in the performance marketing area Um, And this will be a repeating topic in our conversation. Mm -hmm. I'll keep saying we use data and we use technology. And marketing is one example. We're extremely quantitative about how we market and we're constantly optimizing. We are multi-channel. We market through um, 
you know, the online channels starting with search engine marketing, you know, Facebook, YouTube, we get a lot of organic traffic and there's constant optimization and measurement going on. It is very much a science for us. Um, and we also do a lot of optimization on a class of business by class of business level. Yeah. Okay. Because the marketing approach, whether that's the channel mix or the look and feel or the keywords that works for a plumber may not work for a photographer. Similarly to how the coverage is different, we also optimize the marketing. Um, we've made tremendous progress over time in bringing down acquisition costs. As we've gotten better at getting to know our customers and what works for them and what resonates with them. Yeah. Most recently, we're also making a bigger investment in brand marketing um, with our TV campaigns, with our built by business campaign, which I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about. So we are now supplementing a culture and history of performance marketing with more kind of above the line um, yeah. brand oriented marketing um, that we are hoping will help us build more awareness and drive more and more organic and referral traffic over time. Uh, so uh, before we tackle that part, let's go to the the digital and the use of data. I'm assuming um, you are using like Facebook, Instagram type of um, Google Google AdWords. Correct. Uh, All do, of that. You, do you do anything at a finer segmented level? Anything that's um, even more uh, f finely tuned, finely specific to finding those customers? Each of these channels is very finely tuned. Okay. So we have keywords and campaigns for, you know, accountants and real estate agents and plumbers. So we go again to that level, right? We have an effort for, you know, general liability for plumbers and one for professional liability for accountants, because we find that getting that granular is what allows us to squeeze yeah. out the expenses, yeah. right? And bring down the acquisition yeah. costs. I'm I'm curious. You don't have to talk about next results. I'm just thinking of the the platforms in general, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, uh, Google AdWords. Um, have you have they met expectations? Um, I'm I'm finding a mixed bag, but it, that could be just because it, you know a um, the folks that are marketing in those may or may not know what to do or how to optimize those. Have they met your expectations? I think you make a good point. These are not user friendly to an extent where, you know, a lay person can do this and right. be successful, right? I think these platforms require a lot of expertise still to do a great job. Um, we partner very closely with each of these channels, um, you know, be that Google or Facebook or YouTube. And I would say, yes, they have met our expectations. These are very powerful tool sets and someone that knows what to do with them, I think can have a lot of success. Yeah. So you're essentially saying if you have data scientists, you can take advantage of it. Yeah. It, it's, it's sort of what I see, you know, I, I, I think the folks that uh, they, I think a lot of those platforms want to make it seem like, Oh yeah, it's easy. You can finally cut the data, but I think it's much more complex than that. It's it. I think that a scientific approach has to be done. Um, you know, cause you know, you're initially, I think a lot of folks that had done Facebook, you know, throw a hundred bucks at it and it's like, well, yeah, that's not much of a sample size. It's gotten much more competitive over time. I would yeah. say, I would yeah. say, and we see everybody doing this, all of the competitors, legacy and insure tech alike are using these channels. Very few are using them well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's customer acquisition. Let's assume you're successful and business is coming in. Let's talk about the uh, the coverages and things like that. First, um, how, how are the coverages backed? Um, the great majority of what we write is backed by either state national insurance company, which is a fronting, well-known fronting yep. provider, or our own uh, insurance carrier. Uh, called the Next Insurance U.S. Company, which we okay. are continuing to license in more and more states. Yep. Um, so those are the two books of business that we manage. Yep. Um, um, 
So I, I'm, I'm assuming you got um, strong reinsurance relationships. We do. We work very closely with Munich Re, who is also an investor. Um, they've been a great partner to us and having their backing obviously lends additional credibility to what we do. Yeah. So uh, full disclosure, I also have a business relationship with Munich Re um, and I, I concur. I think they're phenomenal uh, business partner and um, in, in so many different ways. Um, so let's talk about coverages. So, um, you know, one of the things I found interesting uh, researching next was you went to great pains in your marketing message to talk about there are differences between electricians and plumbers. We'll just, we'll use that one as the example. Traditionally uh, in small business, those are grouped together. Um, they may have a different uh, SIC code that kind of splits them out, but the coverages are the same and they may just have a different rate. Mm -hmm. uh, talk, a, talk a little bit about how you think about uh, segmentation of uh, trade um, and not, not just like the hard trades, but um, you have a whole swath of different trades uh, that you can sort of segment into. Uh, talk about how you think about that and, and how do your coverages reflect that? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to twist your example a little bit okay. because I think electrician yeah. versus plumber, I can get comfortable with having similar coverages. Yeah. What I have seen again and again, however, is same coverages for an electrician and a photographer and an accountant. And this is where, it's true. you know, I start tearing my COVID hair out. Right. And I feel for the entrepreneur. But it, but it makes it so much easier to put it on one policy. I mean, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. It really does. And so from a distribution perspective, right. And an agent doing business exactly. perspective, I understand it. Right. I just don't have the time to figure out and differentiate between an accountant and a plumber yep. when these are $800 policies. It just doesn't, yep. the unit you know, economics yep. exactly. doesn't work for me. So I totally make sense. And this is where the technology comes in and the data comes in, right? This is my refrain of technology and data. Um, we believe that with technology and data, you can start thinking about, well, you know, the photographer um, may not need a lot of water damage, water related coverages in their GL, but they do need inland marine, which again will be very different from the contractor's equipment and tools that a plumber will need. Yep. And we can start slotting in the right endorsements and exclusions into the policy using technology, not manually, right? In a way that scales and pricing these things in a way that gives the best possible price to each of these professionals. Um, so our photographer may pay you know, 200 bucks for a GL and the plumber may pay 900 bucks. Yeah. And in each case, we are finding that we are you know, often up to 30% more affordable than competition while providing the right coverage to each business owner. Okay. So I'm thinking through, um, now we all work from home, so it's hard to kind of imagine what this, it likes, what this looks like, but imagine we're in an office, mm -hmm. how strange that is. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a digital DNA with an insurance product. What is the interaction between the insurance professionals in next and the technology staff uh, what's what's the give and take because i can imagine if the uh if we're talking sort of legacy level insurance professionals you know they may they may be more comfortable with like well you know one size fits all yeah. um the tech will bring a different different viewpoint but there's only so much so so far you can push the envelope can you talk about the interplay in the office uh, yeah. about how, how those two distinct elements of the business model collaborate with one another. Yeah, great, great topic, one I'm really passionate about. Um, we've started our insurance product team with folks that could not spell insurance. Um, <laughs> we, and this was controversial. And imagine you know, working with regulators in that sure. context for example, right? Sure. But we really brought in folks that knew data and analysis and were passionate about financial services um, and product design. And it was probably two, two and a half years before we brought in, as an employee, our first insurance veteran. Wow. 
we used uh, per night quite heavily in the beginning to help yeah. us bring that expertise. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar and that, with them. There were some interesting early conversations there as well. Uh, but they, they, us, they would strike me as um, very favorable to a more legacy oriented structure. They do. We were yeah. fortunate to be able to build a relationship where they became patient with us and understood what we were about and were willing to lend <laughs> their expertise right, and help us really ramp. Who are these people? <laughs> uh, we can talk later. Uh, some great people over there, actually. I'm a big fan. Um, but over time, we've built up the expertise and we started bringing in folks with more insurance experience. What I have found is that there's, a, there's the right balance that I think we've found on that team of you know, smart analytical challenges, industry standards and assumptions, and smart analytical with many years of insurance expertise. Yep. And it's the combination that has proved to be really, really powerful. And we continue to balance things. I would say on that team, we probably have 30% insurance vets 70% non-insurance folks, and that's working yeah. well for us. Yeah. Um, technology comes in here as well. There's close interaction between our insurance product folks and our technical product folks and the engineering team. These three teams are working constantly in concert to build and optimize our products. We have also made a humongous investment in proprietary platforms that actually allow our insurance product managers to build, configure, and optimize the insurance product coverages themselves. So this allows us to be incredibly nimble and fast moving with our coverages and pricing, yeah. where if we find that we are missing a key endorsement for a photographer, if that endorsement was filed and approved by the DOI, it takes us a couple of hours to add that in, which I think is unparalleled in the industry yeah. and actually has caused us some challenges with our agent partners in certain cases because they're not used to the product coverage is evolving that quickly. But really it's again, it's technology and analytics and the right mix of talent profiles yeah. is what we found has worked for us. I think the key word you said was balance. I think that's, uh, I, I was, uh, as you were talking, I was sort of thinking of some uh, potential metaphors. And then um, I, I think where the insurance professionals come in handy are to sort of lay out the boundaries, right? Like things you shouldn't need to experiment on because they know ahead of time, like it, you'll, it's, it's illegal, right? Or, um, you know, that's been that's tried before. Point. Yes. But you need that balance of like, well, why are we doing it this way? You know? Um, I think it's also not repeating other people's mistakes. Yes. Right? Yeah. We'll have an idea and one of the folks on the team will say, yep, that's been tried and here's why it didn't work. And in some cases we'll say, okay, we can do it differently. Or maybe we say, makes sense, bad idea, let's move on. Yeah. Very helpful set of expertise. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in in my day to day job, we I remember we had like a, um, a good discussion about coinsurance in 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 a product, and um, you know why it's why it's there. Why is coinsurance there? And it's like a history lesson is very needed. Um, but if done right, you don't need coinsurance. If done right, like there's a specific reason why it's there. And you can eliminate that. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 is, it is striking the balance between um, having, uh, being, a, being imaginative, curious. Why is this here? What if? What if, the, what if we did this? What if we did that? With a set of boundaries, just like you said, we don't need to experiment with that. It's tried, it didn't work, or it's illegal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can't do that. Um, and, and so I, I like, I like how you, uh, structure that. I'm, I'm amazed at how long you went without an insurance professional. So, uh, salute to Par Paranite for, uh, being able to collaborate with you. So you didn't need that. Um, so I think, yeah, you didn't ask me about this, but I think the, uh, another oh, please, function yeah. where this balance is really important is compliance, regulatory compliance, uh, where again, we started without industry expertise in-house, but over time we've built what I think is a super strong 
product compliance function with great DOI relationships. And I think, it, I think of it as a secret sauce for us. The speed at which we're able to move a product filing forward and the number of filings we're managing in-house and the amendments that we're getting done, huge enabler for us. And again, enables us to deliver, I think, very strong product to the customer ultimately. Um, yeah, I, I I almost think the DOIs get a bad name and, and uh, or a bad rap, um, and I think part of that is legacy issues, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I've been in the industry for a very long time, and I think there's just over decades, there's just been this um, what appeared to be a conflict, and who knows what the chicken and egg, you know, who started this conflict and how it kind of manifested itself. But I think that's a very interesting part of a technology team coming in is you don't know that there's a conflict there and all you want to do is just get stuff done. And so your natural instinct is to go make peace and have a coffee and have a conversation and mm -hmm. they're a stakeholder that's part of the collaboration. Whereas I feel like for legacy folks, it's... Um, they're a point of contention, potentially, a point of conflict, and don't give them the answer to any question they didn't ask. Yeah. Whereas you're more trying to be collaborative, and I almost think uh, as I get more into this and have these conversations, it seems like uh, the DOIs are actually not what they were made out to be, that it's um, they, they have a job to do as well, and I almost feel like the, the, the digital DNA companies, um, because they're looking to collaborate, just get more stuff done because it's they they make it easier for the regulators to do their job. I agree. And I've seen this in other areas prior to coming to insurance. I was in the debt collection business, um, which is another, you know, highly regulated, yeah. not traditionally customer friendly business, as you can imagine. And I saw the same dynamic, frankly, there. If you really collaborate with the regulator, if you bring your ideas and explain why these ideas are meant to benefit the consumer or small business that they're there to protect, leads to some very constructive conversations. Yeah. Um, so we. It's great. It's great to great hear. No, honestly, um, part of you know any any sort of uh, deep discussion about insure tech and what it means for disruption. The card I can always pull out of my back pocket is like. Yeah, that's a fantastic plan, but the regulator is going to stop you. So it's kind of good that I can't, you know, I might not be able to use that card and that the regulators are, are more, much more amenable. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're just trying to protect the consumer. Yes, the, that's a card we don't allow at Next Insurance. The regulator won't let me, the reinsurer won't let me. We say if you build your case, if you prove it's the right thing to do and it's financially sound, it's like a win-win-win. Like yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so we f we focused on small business, but I see no reason why your product would have that sort of limitation. Um, are your long-term plans, one, to help small businesses grow to midsize and big businesses, but to also maybe, uh, you know, for the small businesses that didn't jump onto Next, catch them as they become midsize and big businesses as well? That is the plan. I couldn't have said it better myself. As you know, there's 27, 28 million small businesses out there. The majority of them are very small. And we tend to forget that. So I think today, you know, the, the, the micro businesses, the um, you know, two, three, four employee businesses we're serving are the majority of the yeah. landscape. Yeah. We absolutely want to serve larger businesses as well. These businesses tend to have uh, more multifaceted, more complex coverage needs. Yep. And part of what we want to do is build out our product portfolio to be able to serve those businesses as well as we can serve the smaller ones on the spectrum. Yep. That is the plan. Um, I, thought, I thought it all myself. Just seemed seem natural. You know what you're talking about. What can I say? <laughs> I think with the larger businesses, I often get questions about, well, can you really underwrite electronically? Don't you need to go see the site? Don't you need to go, you know, 
examine the project. I there are ways. I think so. I think there are ways. I think at the very far end of the spectrum where you are, you know, ensuring an industrial complex, I think more scrutiny is probably needed, but we are very far away from that today. That's the other spectrum, right? So how many, how many businesses? 20, would you say 28 million? Correct. Okay. 28 million. Um, there's uh, probably in the thousands that might fit that court category. I, um, I think everything in between, I think between all of the insure techs that do, that have um, awesome aerial and digital imagery, satellite imagery, um, the street view, and a, a whole bunch of insure techs where you can get, you know, third party data on. Uh, to those that say that, I would say, no, I like, I, I'm one that's underwriting without all of that, you know, mm -hmm. today it's, it, there's so much that can be done digitally. I think that's right. I also think that by the time we get to that few thousand, frankly, and we've got the rest of the market addressed, I'm sure the tool sets will be even more advanced than yeah. there are today. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have about a hundred thousand active customers today, a little bit more than that. So we've got, you know, small, small portion of that 28 million. Yep. And there is so much room for growth and to yep. do more and better for this population. You know, there's no, we're not constrained by the market opportunity at all. Addressable markets, huge. I, I, can, I can definitely see that. Um, we talked about uh, the front end, customer acquisition. We talked about coverage and capacity. Now let's finish off the three-legged stool with back office in the technology around that. I couldn't help but notice in uh, your website, LinkedIn and other marketing messages, how much you um, take pride in um, the hundreds of thousands of certificates of insurance. Uh, as someone that's been in the business for a very long time, I can tell you it's a gigantic pain in the butt to um, issue them, to manage them, who even knows what they mean? Like the, there's always like uh, that insurance class, like, oh, certificate of, certificates of insurance don't mean what you think they mean. Um, why, can you talk about the value add? You know, um, why, yeah. how do you do it? But also talk about, um, you know, why, why it's so important to you that you, you're able to kind of execute on that. So we've rethought the certificate of insurance from the ground up. We've thought about the pain points for our customers, which is, you know, I need these things to get them. I need to call my agent. It takes time. In yep. the meantime, somebody else may yep. get the product. Yep. So our certificates are instant. Our customers can generate them uh, from our customer portal. They can call us and ask. We now have a virtual agent that can help you over the phone get a certificate out. Um, there's no paperwork, right? Everything's electronic. So our customers tell us they love this. They use the functionality heavily and we know it's helping them get work and get their business to grow further, yeah. which is ultimately the goal. We've also thought about the recipient of the certificate and we've talked to these recipients and they say, I have to put the paperwork somewhere. I've got these PDFs stored all over mm -hmm. the place. Um, I don't know what the certificate means. Does it mean mm. that there was insurance in place when the piece of paper was printed? What about now? Is there still insurance in place? So with our certificate, the recipient can click on a link and see if insurance is active now. And that's so even, even after the, even after the request, even after they first get it, it's not, they don't have to keep requesting it. Correct. That's correct. Um, so it's all about resolving pain points for people in the value mm -hmm. chain for mm -hmm. us. And we know that our customers appreciate this functionality, use it a lot. As you've mentioned, hundreds of thousands of these have been shared. Most of it goes to the recipient by email, right? Nothing's being printed, nothing's being mailed. There's no wait time. Customers will do this while on project site talking to their potential employer, right? Mobile, on phone? On the majority of these are done through the phone. Beautiful. Actually, majority of our policies are purchased from mobile devices. 
people do this while, while standing in line at the Trader Joe's. Fantastic. I have to say we've had some people do it while driving, which we heavily discourage, uh, but it's that easy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so um, I want to finish off this particular conversation because this was really interesting. Uh, you recently hired Spencer Hansen of Spotify fame as your creative director. Now, insurance companies don't have creative directors. That's the marketing realm, right? So it's uh, what, what's going on there? Like this, this is uh, what's the interesting aspect that you, that next is doing by hiring a creative director, especially someone who has had success uh, very recently, uh, big success with Spotify. Yeah. Again, we were thinking about revolutionizing and disrupting, which we believe we've done on a number of fronts, but not in how we've thought about our brand yet. Right? So this is what we are asking Spencer to do and what he has started to do. It's really disrupting how an insurance brand can be built and how it's perceived by our customers. Um, and Spencer, as you mentioned, is a well-known name in the creative industry. Uh, he came in and said, you know, let's do this differently. Let's not follow the we're there when you need us mm -hmm. formula. Let's really emphasize the fact that we are 100% focused on serving small businesses. And small businesses are not used to having anybody 100% focused on them, right? They're, they're used to being the afterthought. Um, and Spencer really is helping turn the way we think about our brand on its head with the Built by Business campaign where we are putting the business first. It's not about the insurance company. It's about the businesses we're there to support and to grow. Um, he is building a creative agency for us in-house so we can turn this into another competitive advantage and um, really differentiate through our brand which we yeah. haven't done so far. Yeah. yeah. So th that's, that's um, interesting because um, you're, so it, it's easy to say, but difficult to execute on, right? So uh, traditionally insurance has been very transactional based. And um, I would say for the vast majority of insurance transactions, the insurance company and the insurance buyer don't perceive each other as partners mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. um, you, you are, um, explicitly by hiring a creative director in your company and, and talking about small businesses in a particular way, you're trying, you're almost like changing the nature of the insurance purchase, mm -hmm. right? Like you're, you're looking to establish yourself as a partner with them as they grow. So, um, I'm assuming also as creative director, there's going to be a whole, um, outlay of, I'll call it content, but you know, stuff beyond content where you're going to be looking to help the business, the businesses themselves, not just insurance, not just in risk management, but we're going to help, we're going to help you find ways to grow your revenue, be more profitable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, am I on the right track there? Absolutely. We should hire you into our marketing team, Nick, really. Bless you. And I'm, I'm not being, you know, I'm being serious. I'll talk to our CMO about it. <laughs> um, but yes, what yeah. you said, uh, you know, most recently when COVID came in March, we started thinking about how do we help the businesses? Yeah. We, and I'm being completely honest, we didn't think about how do we shore up our revenue or how do we lower our churn? we've thought about how do we help our customers and um, we've decided to do this in two ways one when your partner is and one partner is in financial trouble the other partner looks to help we said here's a little bit of premium back we think that at this time our loss exposure is probably lower you're not driving as much you're not working as much here's some premium back and we were one of the first in the industry to do this secondly as we talk to customers, what we kept hearing is, I have no work. My projects have been canceled. Mm -hmm. My weddings have been canceled. I need to find jobs. And this is where Spencer came in and said, maybe we can create some jobs. Instead of using our marketing budget 
to get a large ad agency to produce some ads for us. Let's shoot it ourselves from home over Zoom and let's make our customers our stars in this ad, which is what we've done. Yeah. We've created jobs for people, which is the help that they appreciate the most, right? People yeah. said, I don't need charity, help me find work. Um, and for us as an insurance company to help create work for our customers, I just, you know, I was crying when we were watching the yeah. ad. I just find it so emotionally rewarding. Um, yeah. So yes, it, it is about partnership and enabling and helping businesses grow. And they reward us with referrals and great reviews yeah. and loyalty. Yeah. I'm going to uh, paraphrase one of my uh, favorite TV shows, Mad Men. Um, you don't need a big business. You don't need to uh, get big business customers. You're going to make your customers big business. Correct. I love Correct. that. I love that. That's That becomes true partnership because uh, it's so easy in this business to be to worship the premium dollars and just say, wow, look at the size of the premium upscale. But it's another story to um, deliver them when you're starting from a smaller base and say, don't worry, we're in this together. We'll help you get there. That's a different marketing message. I love it. I agree. So awesome. Uh, Sophia, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, for everyone that's listening, I will have um, all in the show notes, I will have all of the contact links to Sophia next. Uh, things that we talked about in this particular podcast. Um, I need to remember not to say this at the be at the end, but at the beginning, but we're still in a pandemic. So it's not that big a deal. Just put on a mask, respect other people. Uh, you still wash your hands. That's good to do anyway. So please be safe. Everybody that's uh, listening, uh, please subscribe. And for Sophia from Next Insurance, thank you so much. Thank you. This was fun. Appreciate Stay it. Stay safe and healthy. Same. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation.